Christmas in the cameras. No. This, there's no cameras here. You guys don't have a ring doorbell camera or anything like that? No, I just ordered one, actually. Oh, really? That's smart. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. We say it often on this channel, in true crime, the details matter. And in this analysis, there's a twist to the tale. There's a clue to that twist in the first few seconds of this clip. And yeah, the details do matter. In this case, the most crucial clue was found in a small round button snap on the uh, tan leather strap holding that K-bar knife, right? I don't think it's for nothing that Corporal Payne mentioned seeing this leather sheath while standing next to the door to Maddie's room. Had anyone actually picked it up, picked up that knife sheath, handled it, toyed with it? Well, that piece of evidence could have been destroyed. Also, it's no coincidence that this unspoiled evidence was found in one of the more remote corners of 1122 King Road, the top floor, right beside one of the victim's bodies. If the most surprising clue was the K-bar knife sheath that the killer left behind, the runner-up is a security camera diagonally across the road at 1112 King Road, which picked up distorted audio, and that is dealt with over here in the affidavit. It says at approximately 4.17 a.m., Security camera located at 1112 King Road, a residence immediately to the northwest of 1122 King Road, picked up distorted audio of what sounded like voices or a whimper followed by a loud thud. A dog can also be heard barking numerous times starting at 4.17 a.m. So that dog barking starts at 4.17 a.m. The security camera is less than 50 feet from the west wall of Kernodal's bedroom. If the criminal genius Koberger suspected of these crimes didn't notice the camera, well, despite knowing where it is, we still haven't located it either. It's not on Google Maps, nor is it on Brian Enton's zoomed-in shot of 1112 King Road from December 20th, the day two CSIs parked right beside the green structure. If anyone wants to sort of put up their hands and say, uh, but... There is a twist to the story, and we are going to get to it. Now, the KTVB news channel on 15 November, just two days after the incident, provided one of the very rare pan shots looking from down the road at 1112 King Road and then swiveling up to 1122 King Road. In this analysis, I want to cover three aspects. Number one, a reorientation of the 1122 King Road vis-a-vis -vis what we'll call the acoustic camera. Number two, an analysis of the peculiar acoustics surrounding 1122 King Road. And then number three, the important investigative insights we get from this particular evidence. I'll also be doing a special live stream later uh, that is time dependent. As, uh, I don't know how long this edit is going to take, covering a separate aspect of the case. I've got to sort of try and fit it in between editing this video and another power failure that's supposed to take place in three hours. So I will provide more details on that on the live stream at the end of this analysis. Before we get to that, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. If you're new to the channel and you've asked yourself, why on earth does a channel dealing with true crime have the word science attached to it, let alone rocket science? Well, you're about to get your answer. In the face of overwhelming odds, I'm left with only one option. I'm going to have to science the shit out of this. If you're enjoying this episode, please like, share, leave a comment, and let's get started. So number one, reorientation. This is one of those crime scenes where no matter how often you look at the same fabric, you end up coming away with something new. So in order to have a fixed sense of where 1112 King Road is relative to 1122 King Road, while well, the iconic eye-branded water tower is directly behind 1112 King Road. Zooming out further, 1112 King Road is just out of picture on the right in this view of the tower taken from 1122 King Road. And that's obviously the 1112 King Road based on Google Maps. Now, with the water tower at your back, this is the view from 1112 King Road to 
towards 1122 King Road. Notice it's elevated relatively higher. The funhouse is higher than 1112 King Road. And besides that, there's, there are a couple of suspended electric cables that are sort of um, in the air, um, but it has almost perfect and almost perfectly uninterrupted line of sight. And in this case, this also means line of sound. And that brings us to the second point, peculiar acoustics. Unfortunately, with the above image blurred out, if we looked at, at this aerial view, make a mental note of where Madison's room is. It's on the top left side at the top. Also note the amplifying effect not only of the flat facade, the two vertical surface, um, surfaces facing the road perpendicularly with nothing interrupting these lines, no trees, no terrain. Also the downward sloping shingle roof provides a, um, a guide to the sound waves, preventing them from disseminating downward and thus strengthening that, that is amplifying the signal which means it can travel a greater distance than it normally would. Because of its elevated position, the signal is also able to pass clean over the neighboring rooftops. That's the signal from Madison's room. And these surfaces may also provide some additional reinforcing of the signal passing overhead. Without going into the science too deeply, think of sounds as vibrations, disturbances of aggregated energy that are transmitted through air, water, or even solid objects. The easiest way to think of sound is to compare it to waves in water. Just as water waves can be redirected due to objects in water leading to ripples, sound waves can also be redirected due to objects in its path, which can lead to echoes. Unlike transverse waves on water, which sort of move horizontally, sound waves are longitudinal, which means as they disperse outward, it tends to be vertically up or down. Now, what makes the acoustics of 1122 King Road particularly weird is the fact that the entire structure sits on an elevated ramp and the house itself is parallel to, to this ramp, basically acting as a megaphone. So when the kids partying, uh, you know, when they were partying and they played a big speaker, they, they placed this big speaker at the kitchen door. It's no wonder there were noise complaints. Probably a better way to orient the speakers was to the wooded hillside directly in front of the porch patio or facing directly into the house. But I would be surprised if noise complaints didn't come from 1112 King Road given those um, powerful speakers were facing in that direction and the corridors of housing as well as the elevated surroundings basically directed so much sound in its direction. If we take it a little bit further, sound is transmitted best through solid objects, then through water and most poorly through air. The more dense the material, the better the transmission. The less noise or interference, the better the quality of reception over a given distance. Because the crime was committed at 4.17 a.m., which according to the weather station at Pullman Moscow Airport, the airport where um, Koberger recently arrived, um, it was the coldest time of day when the crime was committed on November 13. It was 28 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 2.22 degrees Celsius. In other words, below freezing. So the cold air would be denser and thus transmit better than at any other time. Also, the fact that the wind was virtually calm and there was cloudy, it was cloudy overhead at the time of the incident would have led to further fine tuning or enhancing of the sound quality. Overall, we also know the acoustics on Sunday morning, that's November 13th, were unusually atypically good, as reported by numerous residents who described that night as an unusually quiet night. Now, in terms of investigative insights, by far the most valuable insight we get from this, which is fairly rare in true crime, is that we have an audio recording at the time of death. Thus, in this case, we have an extremely accurate estimated time of death down to minutes and seconds, close to 4.17 a.m., whereas initially we were led to believe it could be anywhere within or slightly beyond a full hour. If the survivors hadn't heard anything, that could have widened the unknown period to several hours. In hindsight, the fact that the investigators were certain the crime occurred between 3 and 4 ought to have causes to question whether the survivors really hadn't heard anything. As it turned out, one of them seemed to be awake and heard sounds throughout the entire commission of the crime. 
Intertextually, there are a few cases where acoustics were of significant importance. In the Oscar Pistorius case, the judge decided to accept an expert who described his acoustic equipment as his ears, and the version that the victim didn't scream, the perpetrator did, like a woman, that ended up being the version that the judge actually accepted, if you can believe that. In the Cleo Smith case that played out in Western Australia, a CCTV camera within a campsite recorded little Cleo Smith's voice, as well as the vehicle leaving the area at around 3.30 a.m. In that case, CCTV picked up audio at a distance of 65 feet, which is 20 meters, despite distortions from cr crashing waves and wind. In that case, Ali also said that they were looking for a vehicle and just wanted to speak to the driver, only for the vehicle to be found and its driver to emerge as the perpetrator. I think it's evident now that the so-called eyewitness who claimed to have heard a scream is possibly unreliable, since that same witness never reported any barking, and there was clearly more barking than anything else. Not even this camera picked up a high-pitched scream, but instead lower-pitched noises, thuds, voices, barking, and what sounded like a whimper, quite subtle. And this is where the twist comes in in terms of the story. I'm going to read this from the affidavit and see if you can figure it out yourself. I will put a link to Plunder's um, uh, body cam footage that also deals with this aspect in the description. The affidavit reads, At approximately 4.17 a.m., a security camera located at 1112 King Road, here's the vital part, a residence immediately to the northwest of 1122 King Road, in other words, right next to it, picked up distorted audio of what sounded like voices, right? Now, if you think about it, all of these are very soft sounds. None of it is screaming. Voices, a whimper, a loud thud. A dog can also be heard barking numerous times. That's quite a lot of subtlety to those sounds. You're not just hearing noises. You can actually tell that's a, bog, a dog, that's a person, that's a whimper, that's a thud. The security camera is less than 50 feet from the west wall of Kernodal's bedroom, right? Not Madison's bedroom, um, Zanna's bedroom. So what does that tell you? Well, less than 50 feet is around about 10 meters. And so the uh, location that Google Maps gives you on the corner, that is not 1112 King Road. That is the twist in the story. It turns out that the camera that picked this up is at the house right next door. And you actually heard the young lady at the beginning of this clip saying, I think in February, that they were going to order a ring doorbell camera. Well, it's that camera that picked up these sounds and likely also picked up a vehicle driving by. Isn't it incredible that the, the house right next door to 1122 King Road provided this vital evidence and that the criminal mastermind that was plotting, that visited the site 12 separate times and four times on the night of the incident, didn't actually spot that there was a camera right next door. A little bit clumsy, a little bit lacking in observation skills. But then didn't we also make the same mistake? Did we also not pay that much attention to details? And I only sort of noticed this when someone provided footage of the number of the house. And then I realized it's not that green building to the further south and across the road. It's right next door, right next door. And so probably more of the sounds that were picked up were from Zanna's room, which were right next door, right, literally right adjacent to that camera, whereas Madison's room was somewhat elevated and so somewhat set back. Does that make sense? So in terms of investigative insights, um, finally, you know, I think Jack and Kaylee's dog barking was some sort of indication that the perpetrator was a stranger to the resident, someone the dog had likely never smelled before, and thus someone the dog didn't know. The loud thud could possibly be the perpetrator slamming his car door or peeling away or D slamming her door after the perpetrator passed her. But I think the most likely um, possibility is that Zanna and one's got a feel for her, probably fell against the wooden wall of her room, and that is where the blood came out, the, the side of the, the structure, right at that point. And I think that was during a vicious life-and-death struggle 
with Ethan also in the room. So obviously going to look at that structure, not seeing a camera there and then assuming, well, you just can't see it or it's somewhere there. No, check and make sure. And it turns out that camera is on uh, the building right next door to 1122 King Road. And it was as a result of, I think, someone breaking into someone's vehicle right next door to 1122 King Road on the 2nd of February 2022. And that led to them putting in, installing this ring doorbell camera. So what do you think? Do you think the neighbor who said that he heard a scream, do you think that that is credible or reliable? Also, wouldn't this camera have recorded the vehicle coming and going, the sound of it and also the sight of it? So I'm not going to take it further than that. I will be following up this analysis with a live stream dealing with the surviving roommate's story. Does it make sense? Does D's story make sense? And so we're going to look at a blueprint, deal with that aspect, and then deal with some other aspects as well. We'll also be dealing with an article in the New York Times and their list of 10 key revelations in the Idaho murder case. We'll look at that. And then I also want to touch very briefly on family dynamics as a clue to figuring out the motive question. What needs does he serve by killing? We're going to keep asking that question and see what you guys say. And I will be dealing with that imminently as well. The live should start at around about 7, 7.15, maybe as late as 7.30 EST, depending on how long it takes to edit and upload this video. So look out for that. I'll put a link to the live in this uh, in the description to this video. You can wait for it to appear at the end of this video as well. Thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time.